Okay, so um, I just need to cover off the learning objectives with you, apparently. So hopefully, by the end of this, you'll have um, more of an understanding of the role that equity release can play in later life planning. But first off, could I see, by a show of hands, please, how many are already advising in equity release? Oh, wow. So it's quite a few of you then. So when I get this wrong, you'll be able to shout out and tell me. <laughs> And uh, how many of you are actually thinking of getting into equity release? Okay, cool, so a few of you, right. So in terms of the learning objectives, as I said, we'll be talking about what the role of equity release is in later life advice, product knowledge. I'm going to go through a little bit about the flexibility of the products and how things have changed, even just in the last couple of years. For those of you that are advising, you're already gonna be aware of that. Um, and also recognising opportunities, recognising where this can help your clients and understanding the challenges that this market has still today and has always had. So what I want you to do is to think, actually, what impact is our ageing society having on us as a culture and as a society? Because today, 65-year-olds, as you've already heard previously, can expect to live on average, and whilst we shouldn't be looking at averages, on average around 20 years longer. So the baby boomer generation are actually the most powerful generation. They hold much of the UK's wealth, and most of that is tied up in their bricks and mortar. But they've also got a very different attitude. They have a youthful attitude. They're demanding, they're active, and they're a far cry from previous generations. If I think back to when I was small and I looked at somebody that was in their 60s, if you consider what somebody in their 60s is like now, it's completely different. And to, um, to demonstrate that, if you think of people like Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren, now I appreciate Malcolm McLaren's no longer with us, but they were trailblazers. And their view of, elding, of getting older is completely different to how it was previously. And if you think about the Rolling Stones and the Who and people having children later on in life, and Joan Collins, for instance, I mean, she's in her 80s, and she was once famous for saying that she would keep youthful because she refuses to marry anybody over the age of 40. <laughs> And then you've got the likes of Dame Helen Mirren, a beautiful woman who's vital and active, and again, part of the older generation. So why are we living longer? Well, actually, if you think back to the Roman Empire, they had an approximate life expectancy of 22 to 25 years. Now, I appreciate that's some time ago, but it shows you and demonstrates just how much things are changing. And in fact, in 1900, the world life expectancy, now bear in mind this is the world life expectancy, but that was just approximately 30 years old. And the reasons we're living longer, well, you're all aware of why we're living longer. We've got better hygiene, better food, nutrition, and of course, health and advances in medicine. And that's going to continue. So we're going to continue living longer. But what are the changes in attitude? Well, as I've said, the landscape for the older generation is changing, and it's changing for the better. They have higher expectations, they're active and they're fitter, or we're active and fitter for longer. And for baby boomers, inheritance is actually not their biggest concern, but continuing their lifestyle is their biggest concern. And unfortunately, divorce is on the increase. Not in general, in fact, divorce rates have been coming down, but in the over 60s age group, it's on the increase. And you might argue that's because they've been married for 20, 30 years, they now realize they're gonna live another 20, 30 years, and they don't wanna be with the same partner. <laughs> So what impact is this aging population gonna have? Well, ultimately, power. They will hold the power because they've got all the money and that's the biggest demographic. So in terms of politics, they're the biggest demographic that vote and they hold the majority of the UK's wealth. And of course, there's the impact of pension freedoms, which you've probably heard earlier on today, but what we're not quite sure is what impact that's gonna have on equity release yet but there is a worry as to whether the money will run out quicker now they have access to that money. And spending, the fact that the older generation are going to be the biggest spenders is going to impact on everything from what we wear to what we watch on TV to what we see in the cinema. They hold the power. But the flip side is the cost and the cost to society. So the cost for long-term care and for health care. The older generation are the ones that use these services far more, and that's costly for 
society as a whole. And state benefits. If you think of the old age pension, which was, um, first came out in the 1940s, originally that was anticipated to last about five years. Now it can last 20, 30 years. This is a huge cost to us as a society. And we have a shrinking younger generation that have not benefited from the same things that the older generation have. They're coming out of university with massive debt, on average £30,000 worth of debt. They can't afford to get on the property ladder, and rental property is high. Okay, so just to give you an idea of what the current size of the equity release market is, annual equity release lending reached uh, 1.61 billion last year, which is an increase of 17% compared to the previous year, and it's double the size of 2011. And the number of plans sold in 2015 was just over 22,000. But this is a mere fraction of the potential. So just how big is that potential? Well, there are estimated to be over 11 million homeowners aged 55 and above. And in terms of the equity that they hold, you'll probably have seen different figures, because I keep seeing different figures as well. But it's estimated currently to be around £820 billion worth of equity which is likely to increase to about 1.2 trillion by 2020, and that's just in the next four years. Now, I appreciate that there are headlines just recently that house prices may well decrease, and that's probably due to the instability of the referendum, amongst other things. But even if it does decrease, the exponential growth in house prices over the last 10 years, that decrease will just be a blip. And of course, we've got an ageing population, which is predicted to grow by over 5 million by 2030. And these are a considerable force with a variety of needs that we need to be able to cater for. So what does a typical customer look like? Well, there are no typical customers. There have been previously, but we're beginning to see that evolve. However, at the moment, the average age of a customer is just under 70. And in the second half of last year, we saw a rise in the percentage of new plans agreed by a younger cohort and also an older cohort, 85 and above. And we're seeing more people, as I've said, single people, turn to equity release. And that may well be due to families changing and divorce having more of an impact, because clearly this means that people are looking for more houses if their families are separating. And the customer profile, again, the younger cohort choose a lump sum as opposed to those over 75 which tend to opt for a drawdown. And that might well be driven by the fact that over 75s are looking to improve their income and can continue on with their lifestyle, whereas the younger generation are looking for one-off large purchases or perhaps to pay off an interest-only mortgage or to settle debt. But the average customer still tends to draw on less than a third of their total housing wealth, so it's still a small amount comparatively. And in the second half of 2015, one in six new equity release, plans, equity release plans agreed were on enhanced terms. That's another word for impaired health. So those of you that advise will appreciate this. Um, in as much as if a customer is in ill health, they have a reduced life expectancy, so they can actually release more. So the typical profile has consistently been previously of asset-rich, cash-poor, and that is still obviously the case, but it's not all customers. But to give you an idea of how that's going to continue and possibly increase, more than one in seven of those planning to retire this year have no pension savings and will be totally dependent on state pension. And that's quite a frightening fact, really, because ultimately that's not a great deal of money. But they may well then have a property that's worth a quarter of a million pounds. And one in six will retire with expected annual income below the Joseph Roundtree Foundation's adequate income standard, which is 9,500. And when you consider the average pension pot is around 25,000, 30,000, it's clear that more and more people are going to start looking to their equity in their property to help supplement their older age. So what is equity release used for? Well, we've talked about supplementing income. And traditionally, and this isn't an order of any priority, but home improvements is still the number one reason. People tend to refer to equity release 
to improve their property. And that's because they all, almost always have an emotional attachment to that property and they're not wanting to leave. And they're wanting to improve it so that they have a better quality of life. But large purchases, one-off purchases, holidays, cars, etc., is still a popular reason. But we are seeing more people turn to equity release to pay off their debt. And that's not just secure debt from interest-only mortgages, that's also unsecured debt. But when you consider that this generation has grown up with a buy now, pay later attitude, and the credit card, which was introduced around 48, 49 years ago, clearly they have a different attitude to the much older generation who believe in saving before you spend. And gifting to younger generation, this is becoming a much bigger topic right now. I'm sure you've heard about the intergenerational mortgages. We've had the um, launch of One Family and Metro Bank. And for many, those that are asset rich but are looking at their younger members of their family that are struggling, it makes perfect sense for them to turn to the equity in their property and help the younger generation get onto the property ladder. <coughs> now, if you consider that the average age of a first-time buyer unassisted is around 38, which means they're still living at home, and <laughs> this actually applies to me, my son's still at home, it would make me rush to take equity release, trust me. <laughs> I just have to wait a little bit longer before I can do that. But the thought of getting him on the property ladder instead of paying extortionate um, rent it is obviously an option that I would wish to go for. And home adaptations to make mobility easier, this is something that is inevitably going to increase. People on average don't want to move into long-term care. It's their biggest dread. They hate the thought. But they don't know that they could possibly release the equity to make their homes more adaptable, which will enhance the rest of their lives. And with grants drying up and um, help from local authorities no longer available, it makes sense for them to be able to look at what all their options are. And of course, domiciliary care, paying for care in the home. This is something that we are likely to see increasing people using equity release to pay for domiciliary care. So to give you an idea of a market update, let you know what's happening right now. In total, 17 billion of funding has been provided to homeowners over the age of 55 by the Equity Release Council provider members since 1991. And more than a third has been unlocked in the last five years. So we're beginning to see a momentum. It's a, a change in attitude towards releasing equity. Drawdown is still the most popular method, um, and we've seen new lenders enter into the market. And we've also seen massive strides in innovation. So talking of innovation and looking at product evolution, where well, we've talked about drawdown, for those of you that um, don't understand drawdown, simply it's an, an allowing customers to take a small amount from the outset, and then they have an agreed facility. The beauty of that is that they're not paying the interest until they draw down the monies, which gives them flexibility and it allows them to get at the money on an ad hoc or regular basis. So it's great for supplementing income. Impaired lifetime mortgages, we've already touched on that. These are becoming more and more popular. For those that are in health, reduced life expectancy, need to get at more money. And serviced lifetime mortgages or hybrid mortgages, these allow people to get at the access in their equity and continue to service that so that it's mitigating the impact of the compound interest. But if they then need to compound that at a later date, which frees up their disposable income, then they can do that. This is a great option for a lot of people. And there's also the option to make capital repayments, typically up to around 10%. So if you're wanting or you have a customer that wants to uh, pay off a percentage of the loan that they've drawn down, then they're able to do that. And again, this helps to mitigate the impact of compound interest. We're also seeing fixed early repayment charges become more popular, um, which makes it easy to explain to the client. If For them, it's important that they know how much they have to pay back at any one point. And then there's a downsize option. So if somebody's wanting to protect themselves in the event of downsize, it's possible to have tapered ERCs or early redemption charges, which then reduce to nil after five years. And of course, interest rates. We've all seen interest rates drop on um, lifetime mortgages. In fact, they're lower than they've ever been. But these products are not um, 
you can't d determine if a product is right purely based on interest or on the interest rate. You have to ensure that you know the products inside out and you match that product specification with those customer needs. And of course, we've got longer terms on standard mortgages as well. We're beginning to see the likes of um, Nationwide and others, other mainstream mortgage providers that are increasing that term. And there's also an option to downsize with no early redemption charges on the first death. So for instance, if a plan is taken out by a couple and one of them should die, it leaves the other person free to pay that off and downsize. And intergenerational mortgages, we've already talked about that, and that's very much a buzzword at the moment in the industry. And if somebody is adamant that they want to leave an inheritance, they do have the facility to ring fence some equity. And the equity release that they take will then be based on the rest of the value of the property. So there are probably um, considerably more product features that we could talk about, but unfortunately we've just not got the time at the moment. But that gives you an overview of just how things have changed even in recent years. So equity release in later life planning, well, with increased life expectancy, it also leads to a need for better management. And people do not manage their finances because they underestimate how long they're actually going to live for. And the pension reforms, we've yet to see the impact of people now having access to that money and how that's going to impact on their uh, planning for their finances for what will likely be a much longer life than they are expecting. And debt in retirement is on the increase. As we've talked about, unsecured debt, and of course the interest-only time bomb, as it's been labelled, the first wave of which is due in 2017. This is going to have a huge impact on equity release, because for some that will be a lifeline, but they may not know that this is an option. And it's responsibility of advisors to ensure that the customers are aware that this is an option for them. We've talked about divorce and changing family patterns. And of course, for the younger cohort, and by this I mean the younger customers of, who turn to equity release, inheritance is not necessarily their biggest driver, but continuing in their lifestyle is their biggest driver. And the older generation are wanting to gift now. They want to enable those younger members of their family to benefit, hence the intergenerational mortgage. And of course, the cost of care is shifting from the state to the individual. This will have an impact on people turning to equity release. So there's an increasing need as well for professionals across the board to work together. If you decide that equity release is not for you, or you have a customer that's got a variety of needs, it's very difficult to have a deep understanding about everything and all options that are open to them. So building trusting relationships with other advisors that can complement what you do is the way forward. So where does equity release fit in? Well, as I've already said, they've benefited very much from high price, high price inflation. Um, they're asset rich and cash poor, but of course that's not the whole story. And the reasons for dipping into equity, have, as I've mentioned, are varied. Um, the one thing I haven't mentioned is upsizing, and people don't necessarily think of this. But there are um, situations where somebody may need to move to a more suitable property, be it a bungalow, etc., <laughs> but that could be more expensive than the property that they're already in. So they can actually use some equity release simultaneously, which will enable them to move to a property which is more conducive for their lives. So for those that are looking to become an equity release advisor, Hopefully you'll have a, an idea now just how big this potential market is, but there are things that you need to do. Clearly you need to ensure you've got the right qualifications. Permissions and compliance and robust processes are absolutely essential. You cannot get around this, and you have to have a very good un understanding of what is required. And you also need to consider how you're going to build your customer base. It may well be that your customers already fit this customer profile, but the chances are you're going to have to increase on that and you're going to have to market to a wider base of customers and you have to do that compliantly. So you need to ensure that you do your research, um, check out what is required to become qualified and to practice in equity release. And the Equity Release Council do provide a, a code of conduct for advisors to abide by, which can help you to stay on track. And you also need to consider the reality 
of advising a range of older clients. Now, the chances are that the majority of you in this room are already well aware of that, and you appreciate that it's a specific skill set when you're dealing with an older age customer. If you're not looking to specialise in equity release, then you do have the option to simply refer business. Again, it's about building a relationship with a like-minded professional that you can trust, because it's your reputation that's on the line when you're recommending your client to somebody else. And you need to know that you can have peace of mind that your client is going to get the best outcome. But if you do want to specialise in equity release, then you have a number of options. You can join a specialist company that will offer you support and will nurture you. They'll look after your training, potentially provide leads, sort out your compliance and also your administration backup. That will probably give you the most peace of mind. You could operate under a network, assuming they have the appropriate uh, permissions for um, equity release, or you may decide to establish your own business. But that takes time, investment, and a great de detail to attention, attention to detail, sorry. So what of the future for this market? Well, it's actually probably the most exciting time to get into equity release. We're beginning to see that uplift. The reputational legacy is beginning to change, albeit slowly. So there is a change of image, and the buzzword now tends to be around lending into retirement or retirement lending. And I personally believe that's going to absorb equity release. It won't change the products, and we will still need to have roll-up products, but we will see these products evolve and become more innovative and respond to an increasing customer need. The changes in regulation, well, the FCA have already said that they want to consider how regulation may potentially be holding back this market. And then there's the impact of the Equity Release Council, which is an industry um, body that has cleaned up the image of this market massively. But is the, the question is, are those standards still fit for purpose today, 25 years later? And there's a big debate going on in the industry about this. It may well be that we move away from the current regulatory regime and we have more of a, an approach whereby we're not watering down standards, we're actually extending them, but we extend the standards over a greater array of products. A bit like a gold standard, silver standard, bronze standard. So the current standard would be the gold standard because that is all all singing, all dancing, and it has all the safeguards in place, but that might not be suitable for a different type of customer. So there could be a different set of safeguards that fit that customer. So we would see regulation and industry self-regulation evolve, uh, evolve in line with the products and how they change. And of course, hybrid products. Well, typically now we look at hybrid products as being those that are serviced that also then move to roll up. But it could well be that in the future, actually what happens is we have a mortgage for life, which evolves with how um, our life changes, be it getting married, having children, divorce, retirement, and the view of taking a mortgage to purchase a house and pay that off when you've retired could shift completely. And the mortgage could actually become an intrinsic part of financial planning. One of the things that we do need to get right in this industry is marketing. We need to update the way we market to our customers because at the moment we still seem to have what I perceive to be quite a negative approach and we overload the customer with so much information because we're then frightened that there's going to be reprisals at a later stage. And that can be confusing for the customers and we're not marketing to the need of those specific customers. So what we need is clear informative information that allows them to make informed decisions, as you've heard previously, but that's actually quite difficult to achieve. And if you are marketing yourselves, you have to be very careful from a compliance perspective. So this is something that is an issue that the, the industry as a, whole, as a whole needs to tackle. But what we need is clear, easy to understand terms and conditions, flexible, cheaper products, and there may even possibly be a change to exams. At the moment, as you're probably aware, you need to take the mortgage ex exams, the CMAP exams, and then you take the equity release exams. But it might well be that a standalone equity release exam is the way forward. 
because for those advisors that are not interested in advising on mainstream mortgages but want to advise on equity release, that could be a viable option. <laughs> so what are the market challenges? Well, we do have an issue with compound interest and customers' perceptions and understanding as well as the press understanding compound interest. And it always amazes me that when you're being paid compound interest, you, you get it. But when you're having to pay it, mm, no, I don't quite get that. Um, but it is a difficult concept to try and get over in clear, easily understandable terms. But if a customer is not wanting to service their loan, they have to appreciate that they're going to have to pay interest at some point. And with the KFIs the way they are, it makes it quite clear on a year-by-year -year basis how much that loan is going to accrue to. But it is a challenge that we face. Um, and early redemption penalties have also been a challenge. We've been criticised in this industry for having overcomplicated early redemption penalties. And some lenders may argue that that's what's allowing them to come to market with flexible, cheaper products. But it doesn't remove the issue of trying to explain that to the customer. And this is a challenge for the market. With the impact of pension freedoms, that's clearly had an impact on funding. Um, we're now having to look outside of the annuity-backed companies to pension funds, etc., to increase funding. But having said that, there's a considerable amount of interest. And we do still have a reputational legacy. And whilst I think that that is changing and people are becoming more used to the idea of dipping into their equity, what we need to do is to keep up that momentum and perhaps, as I've said, this move into lending in retirement as opposed to equity release is the way forward. So in terms of the learning outcomes, this is going to be the same as what the learning objectives were, but I'm hoping we can probably tick some of those off. I'm hoping that you've now got, um, for those of you that are thinking of getting into the market, you can understand the role that equity release could play in your business. You've got a slightly better idea of um, the product knowledge and you can understand what opportunities there may well be. Because there's one thing for sure, this demographic and this customer base is going to increase and they're going to continue to demand products which we need to respond with flexible, innovative products which fit a variety of needs. And of course, there was the awareness of market challenges. These are not going to disappear overnight, but we are beginning to see changes. And one thing is for sure, this market can't be ignored. <laughs>